This that gentleman, 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 yeah. This that gentleman, 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 gentleman. Start like two and get three. This that gentleman, 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 gentleman. Two and four like OB. This that gentleman, 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 gentleman. Shoot my shot, then D. This that gentleman, 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 gentleman. Right around on my tree. This that gentleman, 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 gentleman. Start like two and get three. This that jumpman, 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 two four like Kobe. This that jumpman, 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 shoot my shot, then me. This that jumpman, 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 right around smoking my dream. How they fall in the music like Kobe? I'm the greatest ever do it, they don't know it. Straight from the streets where the shots came blow. I came from the bottom where they hate to see you blow. Mama always told me I'm a shine, so I glow. I came from the block where I stood ten toes. Came a long way, now I'm on the top floor. What's up, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of Turtles Take here on 1252 Sports Chicago. We've got a big show lined up for all of you, so thank you for joining us. We've got Julie Harshbarger joining us here at 7.45 p.m., the first female to ever kick a field goal professionally in football. We've got a big show lined up, lots of stuff to talk about. Vince, how we doing? Man, I'm doing great. What a... What a whirlwind it's been over here at 1252 this week. You know, it started last week with, with the great Devin Hester interview and then the the interview her around the world on Wednesday. Oh, absolutely. Uh, our guys, Fat Mike and Angelo, had the chance to interview uh, Bears quarterback Jim McMahon. And Can we even of- call him that after that interview? Oh. Do we have to call him the Packers quarterback Jim McMahon <laughs> now? Uh I, I'm not sure, honestly, with the way that some of the things that he said to our guys. I mean, the interview blew up. It was huge. Uh, good recognition for the network by far. But, man, some of his comments hurt a little bit as a Bears fan. Yeah, I mean, you know, the, you know, professional or whatever you want to call it side of me is like, man, thanks for uh, – Thanks for putting 1252 out there, bro. We appreciate it. But the bear fan of me, you know, look, I had to wear the the camouflage bear <laughs> logo today because I feel like I'm at war as a bear fan. The Packers is the best organization he's ever played with. I mean, come on. What kind of joke is that? How you how you you win a Super Bowl as a starting quarterback for a team and all you do is talk shit about him? Like, who nobody would know who Jim McMahon was if it wasn't for the Bears. Fair enough, fair enough. I do get what you're saying there. And But at the end of the day, some of the things he said aren't wrong. I mean, Chicago historically has been a place that quarterbacks have gone to die, unfortunately. I mean, our our best two quarterbacks, arguably, in franchise history are him and Jay Cutler. So, But Sid Luckman. We had Sid Luckman. I don't want to go back that far. I mean, Well, you know what? The Bears don't really give you an option on that. Absolutely. So we did get some big news here within the last hour about the Bears – Making some moves here, finally signing some wide receiver talent with Marquise Goodwin. Help. Marquise, the fast man Goodwin. I think he ran like a 4 3 40 when he came out. Obviously, he's been in the league a few years now, probably lost, you know, but you still see him even recently. He's still very fast receiver. He's gotten more polished and more developed as a route runner, and his hands have become right. a little more consistent. Um, I think it just really goes to show that they have no plan on Anthony Miller being part of this team. Oh, absolutely. And now is the perfect time to move on from Anthony Miller. I don't care what you get for him, even if it's a mediocre pick that was they less than the value of him in the Anthony draft. Miller, for all I care. Exactly. I'm I'll, be, still- I'll be real honest. I know I know we bash Ryan Pace a lot on this foot or on this show, and that neither one of us are fans of him. But I'll tell you what, if he gets in one offseason, he gets rid of Mitch Trubisky, Anthony Miller. And if he could somehow find a way to get rid of Tariq Cohen, ooh, you know what? I might just have uh, to be a fan. I might have to send him I, a Christmas card or something. 
I don't agree with you on the Tariq Cohen there, but we can talk touch on that a little bit later. You don't I mean, need him. They got Damian Williams now. Tariq Cohen is the only little guy I've known that gets caught from behind every time he has a football. He's a slow little guy. He does run east west a lot, but back and to he's, oh, he's not he's not like you know these elite speed guys. This is true. He's definitely got some development to do if he wants to keep a spot on this roster moving forward. I but, hope with that, but with that being said, let's go back to that signing. What do you think that does for uh, Andy Dalton being the quarterback here? Well, not only does it help Andy Dalton, but I think what it does even more than that, it's going to help Allen Robinson. If you get, you know, you add Marquise Goodwin, you got Dar- uh, Darnell Mooney, if they can, right. I'm sure they're going to add, they're probably going to add a receiver in the second or the third round. If you can add a, you know, a, a, a Tyron Wallace out of Oklahoma State or um, we're talking about the kid out of Auburn, uh, Schmidt right. or whatever his name is. I forget his name, but they got, they were talking about him today with his elite speed. If you had another speed receiver and now you've got Mooney, Goodwin, and another receiver, that's all vertical speed where Robinson can work underneath and he can work intermediate where he gets those, the slants and the 10 yard catches, the eight yard catches. And uh, I would just like to see Allen Robinson work on staying on his feet when he catches the ball. Every, it seems like every time he catches okay. the ball, he falls down and then doesn't get any more yards. But you know, if, if they got that vertical speed, it should open things up for him and it makes things easier for Andy Dalton. Oh, absolutely. Uh, one thing there you said with Allen Robinson that I'd like to touch on is he, yes, he is a great top receiver, and he's obviously the number one on this team. But here in this coming season, he has to do better catching 50-50 balls. That oh, was something that he really struggled with here this past season, and it was evident in crucial moments. So he's got to get better with those 50-50 balls. And I think when you add a speed threat like this to the roster, that will definitely pair well with – him as well as Darnell Mooney, it's going to be good for the offense all the way around. Here's the thing. You had the year they went to the playoffs, Allen Robinson helped his first year with the Bears. He helped the Bears. He made, he made the quarterback's job easier. He did that this past year too, but there were times he didn't help him out either. There were plenty of times that they threw the ball up. You're a number one receiver. You want $20 million a year, $25 million a year, whatever it was he wanted. Go catch the ball. You know, you see the Julio Joneses and, you know, obviously going back, you're talking about greats, but Randy Moss and these guys that they just went up and took the ball away from whoever was there. He doesn't do that. He, he a lot of times love the ball knocked out of his hand or take it away from him. He's got to win those balls. He's got to win, you know, 70, 75% of the 50-50 balls to be considered a true number one dominant receiver to me. Yes, he's the number one on a very bad team. But I do believe he'd be a number one on most teams. But you can't say that he would just show up on any team and be a number one. There's guys that around the league that you say that about. Even Julio Jones, right? Injuries as he's had, and you know a lot of problems he's had, and staying on the field. You still that's still a guy that you go, oh, that's a guy that he's going to go get the ball. If I worst case scenario, I'm throwing it up. He's going to go get it. You know, you get around the the end zone, you throw the fades. You can't, but you can't trust that Allen Robinson is coming down with the ball. He's just not, he hasn't shown himself to be that type of dominant physical receiver. I do understand what you're saying there. Our guy Ron here in the chat saying, imagine how this opens up the running game. This will definitely help open up the running game. You've got two somewhat speedier guys now to complement Allen Robinson, and they've defenses are going to have to respect that. Yeah, and, I mean, if they're running down the field to the receivers, there's going to be less guys to make tackles. But, you know, let's be honest, that's only going to matter if the Bears call running plays. Yes, which your favorite I coach. Don't, I don't want to get you on a tangent here about Matt Nagy's play calling. I don't. Your so I favorite lightly, coach. I tread lightly with my, with my comments here. But I'm just saying in general, they do have to commit to the run game to help the run game. Yeah, and that's something your favorite coach doesn't like to do, so – you know, yeah, it's okay. As long as we win, I don't care if we run the ball five times. As long as we win. This is true, and nobody would be saying anything about the run game if we were winning, only, throw, only yeah, running the ball. They never talk about it when times. you lose. Because then when they go, oh, well, if you would have ran more, you would have won. Nobody ever goes, you know what? We won this game. We look great. But I wish we would have fucking run the ball more. That is true, but... I mean, obviously, with some of the offensive woes that we saw last season, uh, 
it's easy to point that finger, right? It's easy yeah, to no, say for sure. for it's sure. easy to say this is where it went wrong. And Chicago historically has been such a run heavy franchise that you see what they're what they've been doing under Matt Nagy's system the last couple of years. Right. And it's it's really a little bit head scratching for a lot of seasoned Bears fans that have watched this team be so run heavy and so successful with guys in the backfield over years past. It's just it's I kind do. of mind boggling to see him move in a different direction like that. Yeah, for, I do like the Goodwin move for another reason though, because I think it gives them more flexibility going into the draft. You know, if if they go tackle in the first round and corner in the second round or safety in the second round, they don't have to go receiver in the third round because they sign Marquise Goodwin. You now have your top three receivers in Robinson, Mooney, and and Goodwin. Um, you know, maybe that. Maybe that third round pick turns out to be uh, Kellen Mond. You know, maybe they, maybe it's. Uh, I don't think David Mills drops that far, but you know, maybe they get Kellen Mond in third round, or it just gives them the flexibility to do. They they don't have to say, okay, well, I have to get a receiver in the top three rounds now. Right. We've got a comment here in the chat from a Facebook user saying the Bears suck. I do agree that the Bears are not as good as they should be. I wouldn't go as far as saying they suck. They're still my team, and I'm still hoping for the best. But probably a Packer we, fan. It's, pro- it's probably a Packer. It's probably Jim McMahon. <laughs> he probably we definitely uh, watched us and commented saying that the Bears suck. We definitely need to see some improvement out of this unit here in this coming season for sure. We can't be – well, obviously we can't be 8-8 eight and eight anymore with the extra game, but this – 500 mediocre mentality gets us nowhere gets us bad draft picks the ones that we have that we haven't gave away i should say and it's well, hard to lot, develop it's a lot like the bulls you know the the <laughs> it's your dad your dad's talking about the bears suck uh he's a 49ers fan so he's probably a little bit jealous yeah, that you we know just what? Signed. I, I like the 49ers i like kyle shanahan you know, I'm good. I'm good with the 49ers. But no, you know what? I, I relate the Bears right now to the, all those Bulls teams for so many years. They were too good to be in the lottery and too bad to actually contend for anything. Right. And that was something that's, you know, plagued this plagued both the Bears here over the last few seasons. And as you said, the Bulls really with their mediocre seasons over the past. God, when was the last time the Bulls were really relevant, Vince? 2009? This year, baby. <laughs> the rise of the Bulls. I I would sure like to hope that the Bulls are on the right track. We see some – we definitely see some promising pieces. But, you know, my biggest issue with the Bulls was the other night Zach Levine put up 50 points. Career high, obviously. Great stat line. But he was trying to force that in the fourth quarter. He was trying to build that stat line up. And he was kind of taking dumb shots to do so. And one could argue that that cost us the game. You know what? We were on this show. And somebody, I don't know if it was you or Angelo. I think it was Angelo. Because Angelo was with us last Friday. I believe he showed us on his phone. Look, Zach Levine got 39 in the first half. We did our show. I'm watching SportsCenter later that night. Flipping through channels as you know a lot of us do to try to keep track of the sports for, you know, that we're going to cover. And I see he finished with 50 points. The man had 39 in the first half. You tell me you had 11 points in the second half. And then I look right. at it lost by 12. It's like, I just don't get it. Like you, you blew another lead and you had Zach Levine go for 50, but you had 39 in the first half. So that means you the great first half you had Zach, you sucked in the second half. Uh, obviously players are tired after the first half, you know, putting up 39 points, but he's definitely selfish in that regard when it came to the stat line. He was trying to get to 50, as I said. Well, I think there, that's why you have to have a true point guard who can control the ball because Zach tends to four shots, He get, especially when he hits them early, then he feels like he's shooting into an ocean. And he, he, I almost feel like he shoots himself out of the hot streak he's on. You know, he's locked yeah. in and he shoots himself right out of it because he forces bad shots. You know, and I, I really don't like what this offense has turned into. You see a lot of Patrick Williams. He just stands in the corner. And Laurie, when he's yeah. on the floor, he stands in the corner. And, like, I get it. You, you know, you got Zach who likes to drive and kick. But, you know, I, 
Patrick Williams has, we've talked about it before on this show. He's got such a great mid game, mid range game. And he's such a good defender and playing around the basket, getting rebounds. I, I, I'm ready to see him have, you know, 20 points a game, eight rebounds, four assists, or 10 rebounds, five assists, something like that a game. And he's just not having those. He's, you know, you see his stat lines right. every game, six points, two rebounds, one assist. But that's just, you're just not making a big enough impact. Oh, absolutely. I think that's, I love what Patrick Williams does defensively for as young as he is. I think he's a good defender. He's got some room to grow there for sure, but offensively, you're right. He's got a great mid-range game. They don't utilize it nearly enough. And he's not the guy that I want to kick out to shoot a three at this point either. No, definitely not. I mean, you know, you leave Patrick Williams wide open. You don't, it's not a guy that you go, Oh man, he's gonna knock that down. Like he, he's just not, right. he's not a three point. He shoots, but he's not, you know, a high percentage three point shooter. Like I'd rather him play play the the big body screen, uh, you know, screen the smaller guard, slip off it and hit a mid wide open mid range jumper or something like that. Than I would right. have him just go stand in the corner. Especially he's nineteen years old. He's you know he's playing more right now than he's ever played in his career, his whole basketball career. And it's like now we've taken his development and said, we'll just go stand in the corner and we'll throw you the ball. Like, let him let him be right. who he is. Let him play his aggressive, that physicalness. Let him be that kind of guy, and especially when you got guys like Zach and Vooch that are going to handle the ball. He could come and set the screens for them and slip off and hit that mid-range. Oh, definitely. I, I definitely think that the utilization of him has been poor by Billy Donovan. I like a lot of the things that Billy Donovan does, but – the way he's the role that he's putting Patrick Williams in, I would say is almost hurting his development at this point. Absolutely, I wouldn't say, it absolutely is. And I guess I wouldn't go as far as saying hurting it, but it's stalling his development. It's definitely slowing it down and delaying it for sure. And that's just something you can't do, especially when that's a guy that you brought in here to be a building block moving forward. With Zach, obviously, is our number one building block, but. Patrick's a guy that they hope can evolve into a solid building block for this offense as well. Right. Well, and you added Vooch who, you know, obviously he's not to the level that Jokic is, but he's that type of big. He's going to get you, right. you know, double digit rebounds. He's going to pass the ball. He passes the ball really well. He's a guy that I'm, I'd rather the ball be in his hand a little more. You know, he, he did that his whole career and you know, that's why he's an all-star. That's why he's as good as he, that's why you gave up what you did to go get him. And I know that everything they did was for going forward, not for this year. And I think a lot's going to change right. the off season. I still think they go get Lonzo ball. I think there's just way too much talk about Lonzo ball and, and not even just like my preference. I think he's a good fit. I just think you hear his name way too much with AK and the bulls and guys they target for them to all of a sudden just not go make a run at him when he's going to be a free agent. And it's really something that they have to do. I mean, we've touched on it before, whether it's ball or whoever the guy is that they go out and get, they have to get a true facilitating point guard to be successful next year. Yeah, If, absolutely. if they go out and get a true facilitating point guard with Zach Vooch and Patrick Williams uh, being in there as well, I think, you then have the momentum to be a top four team in your division. But I don't know. They got to go out and make that move. They got to get that true point guard. And it's something that this team's lack, that this team has been without for a long time. I mean, who was the last true point guard that the Bulls had? Derek Rose. And 2009's along, or well, he was with the Bulls a little bit after that, but. 2009 was Derrick Rose's arguably most round season as a true point guard. And you know, it, I miss I miss the MVP Derrick Rose. Oh, absolutely. I think we all do. That was I watch the I watch highlights of him now with who's he with now? The Knicks? Yes, New York. I watch him now with the Knicks, and I get it. Yeah, I see him in Tibbs. I get a little I look a little reminiscent of Tibbs, <laughs> Tibbs and D Rose, you know, when we were battling with them with the Miami heat, when LeBron and LeBron and Wade and Bosch and that, and man, you know, I just think I just miss that Derrick Rose. I miss him attacking the basket. You know, if, if he doesn't get hurt and I know I'm going to catch a lot of shit for this, but if Derrick Rose doesn't get hurt, 
nobody cares about Russell Westbrook. Oh, absolutely. I would agree with that. I, I'm not a big Westbrook fan. I never have been. I don't think that – obviously he's done some things for the teams he's played with, but I don't think he's an elite player. He's not a superstar by any means. I'll tell you right now, Russell Westbrook, Damian Lillard, you know, uh, I don't know who else, but those two really to, to the top of my head come up. Those two will never win a championship unless they are a role player on somebody else's team. They are never going to lead a team to a championship. Russell Westbrook is going to get you a triple-double almost every night, and you're going to be one of the worst teams in basketball. He's shown it now for years. And Damian Lillard is going to keep shooting farther and farther threes. Pretty soon he's just going to shoot it from out of bounds, I think, when they inbounds it. He's just going to shoot it instead. And you're still going to lose a bunch of games. They're going to be good. They're going to make the playoffs. Everyone's going to say this is Portland's year, and – Come playoff time, he's going to be off a couple nights, and they're going to get they're going to lose in a seven game series. Yeah, and that's that's the biggest thing for me when it comes to guys like Lillard and you know all these deep three point shooters. When when does it stop? When do you quit backing up? I mean, you've got they're guys. They're not ever. There's going to you've be got guys that up. are you've got guys that are practically just right over the half court line and they're draining three point shots. Yeah, that's cool, but. Is is it really meaningful to have just that skill on your team when you can't win down the stretch because you've got guys that are hugging the ball too much too? So, our guy Tyler said not elite dude average a triple double for like three seasons. First off, I never said he wasn't elite. He's gonna get you a triple double almost every night out, but you're gonna I, lose a shit ton of games. So, what I, do you want out of your point guard? Do you want do you want him to have a triple double and you guys lose, or would you like him to have you know? 12 points, 10 assists, and you guys win. I did actually say he wasn't elite. I said he's not a superstar. Yeah, right. Stick to it. He's not elite. And he's an elite stat stuffer. That's it. You know, who, you know who I'll take over him? I'll take TJ McConnell from Indiana over him. TJ McConnell, you see him, he's got six points or four points, but he's got 15 assists and four steals or 13 assists and six steals. You know, the one game he had 10 steals. Give me that guy. He's going to make me my team better on defense. Westbrook. He, he'll play a little bit of defense, but not like that. He's not taking the ball away on ball defender. No. Just lock up whoever you got. And he he's going to get you a bunch of points. We just shoot the ball a shit ton of times. You know, the, when right. Bradley Beal was out, we saw it. It was the old Russell Westbrook. He was out there shooting the ball 40 times a game. I don't care about that. They're, they're still one of the worst teams in basketball. If you're elite, it, there's only five guys on the court. If you're elite, your team's not one of the worst teams in basketball, even if you're the only guy. Oh, absolutely agree. And that's, I just personally am not a fan of that ball hogging mentality. I mean, I, you see it with James Harden, you see it with him, especially, I mean, James Harden's one of those guys that they're in Houston. He was hogging the ball like crazy. He's done better since he's moved over to Brooklyn. But you but he, see Harden, he goes to Brooklyn and now everyone's like, oh my God, James Harden is elite passer. Like, you look at him, he's averaged double digit assists for, like, the last four seasons. You just didn't know about it because all anybody looks at is he's scoring 30, 40, 50 points a game, but he's getting you them 10 assists, and they're winning games. Like, yeah, no, they haven't won a championship, and he's, and he's you know, he forced his way out of Houston. I get all that stuff, too. But if you compare him and Russell Westbrook, you know, Harden's teams, they're not worse in the league no matter what. He's going to score way too much for them to ever be that bad of a team. Russell Westbrook, he's on teams that are just horrible. And I just I, – I'm not a fan. I think he is way overblown because of the triple doubles and everybody falls in love with that. But if you look back, I mean, when he when it first started, when he really first started the triple doubles, there were guys in, in uh, OKC that Steven Adams and them guys, they'd go up for a rebound and they'd see him and they'd back up and they'd let him grab the rebound. I'm like, what the hell is that? Just grab the damn ball. But right. it's stat stuffing. Our guy Tyler's saying Harden is the greatest offensive player of all time. I'm I'm not even going to respond. I'm not I'm not going to get upset tonight. I I'm hope, not going to get upset tonight, Andrew. I truly hope that was sarcasm. I don't have enough time to go into that one. I mean, I, oh my gosh, I'm not even I'm not even going to touch that. I I, I promised myself I wasn't going to get upset tonight. You started with the Bears. You, <laughs> then you went to the Bulls and the struggles they're having. And now Tyler, our guy Tyler over here wants to talk about greatest player of 
offensive player of all time. Come on. I just I'm not even gonna <laughs> not even gonna do it. Let's let's move on. Let where would you like to go next? We have so many options tonight. We're gonna cover so many topics. We got a great show. It's gonna be awesome. Where do you want to go next? I would say let's touch on uh some recent news we had with Lamarcus Aldridge. Uh oh, finally hang I don't want to say finally hanging it up, but hanging it up because of medical issues. He had some issues with his heart. Uh, obviously, he experienced that during a game, and he said enough is enough. Yeah, I guess from what I was reading and what I heard, I guess it was uh, you know all of the last week he played. It just didn't feel right, and then he went to the doctor. He had a regular heartbeat. Um, I believe he has to get a pacemaker, and you know, um, one of my best friends. Uh, he's, you know, he's 30 in his mid thirties. He's had a pacemaker as long as I've known him. I've known him a long time. Um, you know, that shit just, unfortunately, it, it, I, I don't understand how it comes up out of nowhere is my thing, you know, and maybe it's something he's been playing with his whole career, you know, and just didn't really realize it. Like, I don't want to say he doesn't exert himself cause he does, but you right. know, as he's gotten older, maybe it's brought it out of him, you know, but at the end of the day, it's, Definitely a shame. He's a great player. You saw when he, you know, everyone started to say, oh, he's done, blah, blah, blah. When you see him go to Brooklyn with them guys out and he's putting up 20 points a game, you know, 20 points, eight rebounds right right out of the gate there. And obviously the man can right. still shoot the ball. Yeah, definitely uh, disappointing to see him hang it up. But I understand. I mean, your health comes before anything, before any sport. And if it's something you're not comfortable playing the game because of that, I totally get it. And yeah, I, I don't think it tarnishes his reputation as a player at all. Moving no, forward. not at all. You know, and he said, you know, his career of basketball has been his life and his family has been basketball first. And he said, now it's time for his health and his family to come first. And, you know, it's, he's not a young man. He's not, it's not like he was going to play for another 15 years. You know, I just, you know, He's blessed that it's at this point of his career, not at the beginning, um, because, you know, sometimes that stuff comes up right at, right out of the gate. And you, your career is over before it starts. Um, right. On a side note, I happened to trade him in fantasy basketball like three days before he retired. So that was kind of cool. <laughs> so, you, you know, know that, that, that made me smile a little bit when I read that. But, you know. I guess you knew something that we didn't. I'm just kidding. Nah, I mean, you know, it was just a good deal. I, I couldn't pass it up. It, it, but, hey, I got I, I moved him before I had to drop him because he retired. But speaking of him retired, did you did you see Damian Lillard? Did you did you hear his interview that he gave about it? I did. I caught clips of it. And obviously the one big thing that came out of that, obviously the respect and camaraderie that he had for him as a player – but as well, he went on to say that he believes his jersey should be retired. Now, all the respect think, in the world to the man, Vince, what do you think of that? I think Damian Lillard talks too much. Like, he really does. Like, if he was on one of these other teams that was competing for championships, maybe he wouldn't talk so much. Maybe I'd like him more. I don't know, but I just feel like he talks way too much. You could go out and you talk about how great he is, how close you guys are. All that, all that, I was like, man, what a great interview. And then he was like, oh, they should hang his jersey. And I was like, really? I mean, he's a great player. Uh, maybe not even great. He was a really good player. He Agreed. was a good shooting big. But does he, I mean, do you really, when you hear LaMarcus Aldridge, do you really think, oh, jersey retire? It, you know, I don't. And... It's not to take away from anything he's done in his career. I believe he was third in scoring all time over there in Portland. What did they had? Exactly I mean, what I was I, getting here, at. I pulled up the Portland Trailblazers jersey retired and retired jerseys. And it, I'm gonna read the list to you. And was that was that our guy Tyler that said one of the best players Portland's had? Yes. Well, clearly he forgets the the end of this list and i'll just let him hear it but it starts off with guys larry weinberg dave Chwardzik, lionel hollins okay but even lionel hollins he averaged 14 points four assists two steals larry Steele, eight points one and a half steals maurice lucas 
five seasons in Portland, averaged 15 points, eight rebounds. He was there five years. They retired his number. Now we get to the guys. Clyde Drexler, Terry Porter, Bill Walton. Those guys are you retire jerseys for, not LaMarcus Aldridge, not just because, you know, I feel like if if he had played his whole career out, say he plays another three years in Brooklyn and then retires or plays this year in Brooklyn, goes somewhere else and, you know, eventually finally kind of fizzles out of the league, nobody would be like, oh, we got to retire his jersey. But I feel like in sports when something happens, something tragic happens to people, we're like, you know what? We got to celebrate this guy. We got to we got to honor him. And it's like, sure, but retire his jersey? Like, you're trying to tell me, and Tyler, I got to tell you, you're trying to tell me that LaMarcus Aldridge was to Portland what Clyde Drexler, Terry Porter, and Bill Walton were? Come on. It just, it doesn't even compare. Well, and at some degree, you have to factor the market there in. Portland, aside from, you know, those few guys and then having Dame Lillard have never really had top-notch players. They're not. I don't want to say they're not a big market team because obviously they get a lot of attention now, but historically it wasn't a big free agent destination or anything like that. So do you factor that into whether you hang his Jersey up or not? The not fact that, no, I, I, I could, if I owned the trailblazers or even I was DM form, whatever, I could never look up to the, to the rafters and see Terry Porter, Clyde Drexler, Bill Walton, LaMarcus Aldridge. Fair well, enough. They I don't mean. go together. He he was a very good player. He was he was a really good shooting big, but I mean that's it. Like he wasn't it's not like he was a dominant player in the NBA where you were like, "Oh, he's the best player in the NBA." Like Right, right. He never really did that. Our guy Scott here in the chat saying he'll be in the Hall of Very Good. Yeah. I I could and, agree with that. And you know what? If Portland wants to put him, I don't know if they have a like a a ring of honor or whatever. Yeah, Scott Rudin coming through. I forgot about Clifford Robinson. You know, but um, as I was saying, you know, if they have a, like a, a ring of honor or they want to honor him and, you know, put him in that, sure, that's cool. But, like, come on, we got to retire his jersey. Why do we got to retire everybody's jerseys? Like, th- that's like all of a sudden now that's what everybody wants to do. Oh, we got to retire jerseys. We got to retire jerseys. Why? Like unless right. you unless you were an absolute dominant game changing player, why do we have to retire your jersey? Let somebody else wear the number. Maybe that you never know. Maybe the next person to wear it is going to be the the best to ever play the game. Agreed. You never know what the future could bring. Our guy Tyler here says he'll get into the Hall of Fame. Everyone gets into the Basketball Hall of Fame. The the second half of that just proves my point. Every if everybody gets in, then he's really not that good. Yeah. The Basketball Hall of Fame obviously has some great players in it, but it does seem like more and more guys are getting I don't think LaMarcus Aldridge will ever be in the Hall of Fame either. I just don't. He didn't do enough. He, at no point in his career did you ever say, oh, LaMarcus Aldridge is the best player in the NBA. And at some point you have to look at it like that. I mean, it's not the Baseball Hall of Fame where it's extremely difficult to get in like Tyler touched on everyone, almost everyone, it seems like nowadays does get into the basketball hall of fame. And that almost takes away the, the sentiment, the specialty of it a little bit when you start. Speaking of the hall of fame, did you see that Michael Jordan will be inducting Kobe? I did. And I think that's huge. It's a great move, obviously by Michael and, I, they had some great clips, obviously, playing together. They truly respected each other as players, and they had fun on the court. I mean, I like it. They had a great relationship, and Michael continues to have a good relationship with Kobe's family, obviously, after his tragic passing and everything. So I don't think there's anyone better that could have done it. I really like the move. I don't know if you're on the same page with that, Vince. How do you feel about it? So I think that there's a couple – couple people that would have been really, really touching speeches about Kobe. Um, I think Michael is definitely up there with the most, if not the most, per, you know, obvious person for that. I think his, you know, he takes a lot of, a lot of heat and it's his own doing, but he takes a lot of, 
lot of flack for not being a public face, not being with fans a lot, not doing a lot of things that you would like Michael to do. Um, a lot of people didn't like that he wasn't more involved with the All-Star Weekend when it was in Chicago and doing right. things. I thought his speech at Kobe's memorial was everything that anybody could have asked for Michael to be. And then some, you don't get to see that side of Michael very often. No. Um, you know, and it just, it was different, man. He played when, when there was no Facebook and there was no, you know, and, and a lot of people's opinions probably be different about Michael Jordan. If his whole <laughs> life was on blast 24 seven, like the players are today. But, you know, he grew up in that more private, you know, private mentality, private life, not doing everything in the face of the public, even if you don't like that. You know, and I think people, yeah, they a lot of athletes who are like that take flack for it. He does. I think Jay Cutler, I think it's a lot of a lot of the, the heat that Jay Cutler gets is for the same thing. And, you know, at the end of the day, these guys are humans, too. You know, just because right. you're the best basketball player to ever play doesn't mean that you have to be who everybody wants you to be you know you're still you still are who you are you know on the court he's the best player ever you know does that mean he's the greatest teammate no but does it mean he's gonna do all the the public appearances and the autograph signings and shit like that that we would like him to do no probably not but you know what if you if you if you really watch through you hear all the stories that of just things he did for people and you know when he he has that you know the the interview he or not interview but the speech he made um, at the memorial, I, I think there's nobody better that's going to give you that kind of speech at the Hall of Fame. I would agree. I I think it's a really classy move. I mean, and just not to take away from that, but you know, you said there with Jordan, obviously uh, not being around technology as much uh, back in the day when he was playing. It was the newspaper and the radio, TV, and that was it. I mean, you didn't have Facebook, you didn't have Twitter, YouTube, all these other platforms. So obviously, uh, even in Jordan's career, he was all over every media outlet that was available, right. and it was tiring to him. So do I blame him for not doing more publicly? I really can't because at the end of the day, the guy made his money. He, was, he had the greatest career of any NBA basketball player. I mean, he is the GOAT. And – if he doesn't, if he doesn't want to go do an interview with this person or that person, or, you know, step out into public because he's got his money, he's comfortable, he's spending time with his family, he's sitting at home. You can't fault a man for that. Right. At least I can't. I mean, I do get it. Obviously, as a fan, I would love to see him doing more, but I understand his side of it too. He, yeah, no, you know, I definitely get it. And you know, transitioning here a little bit, um, you know we kind of talked about how now today's day and age, the athletes are so used to Facebook and Google and everything else. And everybody's everywhere. Um, I got to get your opinion here. I saw this, this, you know, eight, we heard a rod is going to be buying the, the Minnesota Timberwolves <laughs> and the, the Minnesota Lynx and uh, Anthony Edwards. He was the number one overall pick in last year's basketball draft. They asked him about a rod and he said, I'm not really, I don't really know who that is. He said, I'm not a baseball guy. I don't really know who that is. Are I, you kidding me? Are you <laughs> kidding me? That's all I have to say. I mean, I don't care. I understand the guy's young, but he's gone on record in interviews saying that he was a very high caliber baseball player. Right. He played both no. at, at Georgia. He played baseball and basketball. Like how do you, as a, as a 19 year old kid, how do you, or 18, then 17, whatever. How do you play baseball and not know who Alex Rodriguez is? And how do you, exactly. and how do you say you're not a baseball guy? Oh, I'm not really into baseball. Well, how are you not into baseball? You played it your whole life. Yeah, you're not into baseball. You played it your whole life. Obviously, when you're trying to be the best at whatever sport you're playing, and him being a dual sport athlete, obviously he looked up to guys in basketball and he had to look up to guys in baseball. And even if he didn't look up to him, he at least knew who he was. I mean, you you would have to watch no baseball media when he was playing. I mean, the name even, was out there everywhere. 
even after he played the the steroids and everything else, he was all over ESPN. He was all over Sports Center. You're telling me that he didn't? He never heard of you know, not never heard of him, but you know, you didn't. You don't know why Alex Rodriguez is special. Why his name means something? Um, right. I mean, you know, you know, I don't I don't follow all sports as much as I do. Like I'm a big baseball guy, but football, basketball, that kind of. But I, even the sports I'm not really into, like soccer. I, I like soccer. I'm just I don't know a, much, a lot about it, like a lot of people I know do. But I still know who the best players in the world are. And at one time, he right. was the best player in the world at baseball, or at least one of. You know, baseball is hard to oh, say yeah. the best player other than you know Mike Trout. But you know, it's hard to say. I don't know who that is or why his name's special. And is and even if you do, why would you say that? Unless, like you right. said. Unless you were trying to to get a little grab the a little spotlight there and get your your face all over everything, and I think that's what it was at the end of the day. I don't think it was anything more than a media grab, and it's like I said when you go on record saying that you know you were very passionate about baseball and everything like that. How can you turn around and say you don't know who the guy is? You at least right. are aware of him and you're aware of his career. I, right. and, I'm, and a, just I'm a Chicago alone. fan. What's that? I mean, I'm a Chicago fan, but I obviously know who he is. Saw him play many, many years. I mean, right? come on. That's absolutely ridiculous. And it was just a little bit of a, a chase for some media time, I believe. And it worked. Obviously, people are talking about it. But yeah, I, here we are talking about it. <laughs> right. I wouldn't <laughs> want to be I wouldn't want to be that guy that says I don't know who the new owner of my team is. Right. Let alone when when it's a guy like Rodriguez. Come on. <laughs> right. No, I definitely agree. Uh, you know, speaking about owners, we the the news came out earlier today that Dwayne Wade has bought um ownership in the Utah Jazz. Okay. He's not gonna be the the majority owner like A-Rod is. He doesn't he's not, you know, he's just having a small piece, but it's interesting to see some of these guys now get into owning teams we've heard lebron say that's a goal of his in his life is to own a basketball team you know i don't know what kind of um what kind of say dwayne wade is gonna have in it um you know i thought it was interesting they said that uh um the i forget his name but the the owner in miami he came out and said that they had actually um approached d wade about owning part of the team and he wasn't ready, wasn't ready to do that. So I don't, it's kind of interesting, but it's, it's just weird to see it's the Utah jazz. You know, it's weird to see a rod. It's the Minnesota Timberwolves, you know, magic Johnson. He bought the LA Dodgers. He didn't buy the Cincinnati reds or the Milwaukee brewers. You know, he bought right. the LA Dodgers, you know, Dwayne Wade's buying, obviously not the whole league. He's buying into the Utah jazz. Uh, a rod is, he, he's the focal point of that group and they're buying the Minnesota Timberwolves. It's just, you know, I, I it's just kind of weird to see those teams be the ones that get these guys into ownership. Yeah. And I would agree, especially with the D Wade situation. I mean, the jazz obviously are doing some things here. Now, Rudy Gobert's very, a very dominant player. I like him personally a lot, but you know, it just makes you wonder, is there a reason that Wade didn't go after that part ownership in the heat other than just saying, I'm not ready, you know, as a blanket statement, was there something underlying there? I don't mean to speculate, but right. was there something underlying there that prevented them from having a deal happen? And when was it, you know, it's easy to say, well, we approached him, you know, was he still in the mindset of playing? Like, you know, right. was he trying to, was it, was it during, you know, cause they had that little rough patch there where, D Wade wanted to keep playing and they were like, eh, we don't really want to pay you like that anymore. And, you know, and then we got him here for whatever that was that <laughs> they called those seasons when he was here and the seasons in Cleveland and the, the Dwayne Wade tour, but you know, we'll see maybe, you know, we don't know, maybe he'll become a bigger, bigger owner, or maybe that's part of why the Utah jazz stand out is that, He's got an opportunity to maybe have some some input on what goes on there. Um, you know, we don't really know, but it's it's cool to see these guys now transition from playing to owning. Oh, absolutely. And I think it's good for the league, obviously, with 
Dwayne Wade and the basketball experience that he has, even if he doesn't have a large say in what the team does, I mean, moving forward, I think that he will have, you know, somewhat of a say. I mean, all all ownership groups, no matter the percentage, have a say to an extent. So it'll be interesting to see what uh, he does and how he how he if he does affect that team, how he does it moving forward. Yeah, definitely. It, it's you know, it's one of those things. It could it could be something that you know, five years from now, that's all we're talking about is oh man, D Wade's team, the Utah Jazz, or it could be something five years from now, no, nobody even remembers that he owns part of the team. Right, absolutely. So we'll have to see how that goes, and we'll have to see what happens here in the future with the Jazz. We'll have to see what happens with uh, A Rod's group owning the Timberwolves. Uh, see if that. If those type of moves affect the team at all, if they do in a positive way, great. If they do in a negative way, that's too bad, but that's the ownership direction they're moving with going forward. So we're going to take a quick second here, guys, and take a quick word from one of our sponsors here at the 1252 Sports Chicago team, uh, Nick and Ivy Brewing out in Lockport. Hello. This is Paul from Nick and Ivy Brewing Company. We are located at 1026 South State Street in historic downtown Lockport, Illinois. We are very excited to be partnering up with the Fat Mike Chicago Sports Show as well as the 1252 brand because we are one of the few Chicagoland breweries that embrace sports and sports culture. Come in for a fresh brewed beer made right here in Lockport while catching the game of your favorite team. Stay for the live music that we have booked every weekend or just come for a cozy atmosphere to enjoy a good conversation with a friend, loved one, or complete stranger. Nick and Ivy makes you feel right at home no matter what the occasion is. Follow us on Instagram and Facebook by searching for Nick and Ivy Brewing Company. Visit our website for our up-to-date tap list or to go shopping on our online store at nickivybrewing.com. That's N-I-K-I-V-Y brewing.com. Come in today for a fresh brewed beer born and raised in Lockport, Illinois. And we're back, guys. Real quick, just wanted to bring up the fact that we have a huge live show going on out at Nick and Ivy this Sunday. Ooh, I can't wait. We've got Fat Mike and Angelo coming out to talk some sports with Chicago sports legends David Schuster and Fred Hubner. It's going to be a great show, a great time. Uh, Paul's got some new beers releasing over the weekend. Uh, and they've got one of the local pizza places uh, serving up some hot pizza as well. So it's going to be a great time, guys. If you're in the area, please make sure you do stop out. We'll have some raffles going as well as a 50-50. It'll be a great time. You can meet some of the 1252 team. So absolutely stop out if you're in the area. We'd love to see you guys come on out. I'm excited, man. I mean, they every time we show them commercials, it makes me want to drink one of their beers. You know, oh, they absolutely. had that... Uh, the people's elbow and all the other, you know, cool beers they've been coming out with nonstop, man. I'm uh, definitely excited to get there, try some beers. Uh, you know, who knows what's going to happen on the, the fat Mike and Angelo show. That show, man, is is banger after banger. They've been tearing it up lately. So the, the next show, like you said, will be Sunday, the live out there. Uh, be a lot of fun. If you're in the area, even if you're not, come on out. You know, it'll it'll be worth the drive for sure. Oh, absolutely. With that being said, Vince, I think it's about time we bring our guest on. And I'm going to let you introduce her just because you guys have had a relationship, obviously, at the professional level with football and things like that. So why don't you go ahead and introduce our guest that we're going to bring on here, Vince? So you kind of gave a little tease earlier. She is the first female to, we thought, not record points, but record a field goal in professional football. And that's Julie Harshbarger. Hi, Julie. How are we doing? Good. Hi, Julie. Doing Thanks well. For Thank you for joining us. Thanks for joining us. This is Gus. Uh, sure. uh, hi, Gus. <laughs> we, we always love when the dogs get in the interviews, too. It happens. We totally understand. So, so, you know, before we get into questions and going back and forth, Julie, you want to give your story a little bit? You know, you don't have to go into super detail, but, you know, just kind of let everybody know who you are and how you became the phenom you are. Um, all right. Well, my name is Julie Harshberger, and um, I have always been, like, involved in sports, like, since I was a little kid. 
Um, my first love was soccer, and I, um, I kind of fell into football on accident by like a double dog bear from a friend. And I loved it and did really well at kicking and um, opportunities opened up for me to continue kicking and now here I am today. So I got to play in um, high school and college and then semi-pro and pro indoor. Hi, Brie. Hi, Steph. Hi, Steph. <laughs> <laughs> you, your, your fans and followers are definitely out, that's for sure. We got Scott here in the comments saying Blitz Reunion. Yes, Blitz Reunion. <laughs> Great guys. But no, you know, Julie, you've kicked all over, you know. Um, it's kind of cool when you – when you look you up, it even says in your Wikipedia, you know, the average – we've seen a lot of different women play football, and the average career is less than a year, you yeah. know. And you've seemed to find a way to play for, you know, way more than that. You know, I think it says seven years, but I think we're even more than that now. And, you know, find a way to do it on all different sorts of indoor, outdoor uh you know, and stay, stay healthy, stay, you know, dominant and do it at such a high level, winning many times special teams player of the years and different awards. And what kind of, what kind of training, you know, you said you played soccer. What's a little bit different in the training that you had to start doing when you started playing football versus soccer? Um, for football, it was more like uh, just repetitive type stuff with kicking like steps and then just trying to get like my mind right. Cause usually if I'd have a bad game, it was because I wasn't mentally focused or if, you know, maybe there was a, <laughs> if there was like, you know, a hamstring pull or something like that, um, just making sure to properly recover after workouts that kind of stuff um, became a lot more important. Like soccer, I could always, you know, like tough through it and play through it. But at the, the kicking level, it was a little different because like if you, you know, couldn't extend your leg high enough to get the kick. I don't know, it was kind of weird, but you know, just focusing mostly on like recovery and stretching and mindset. Well, that's awesome. You know, did you did now did you play football in college as well as soccer? Um, yeah. So in college, um, my freshman and sophomore year, I played at Rockford University, and I played both soccer and football during the same season. And then my junior year, I transferred to Benedictine, and I played soccer, and I tried to play football my junior year. And then um, my senior year, I broke my baby toe and found out there was, like, a tumor in it. And so I, it was too much stress on my foot to play both. And then there were some other things, too, like with the, the coach from the team. And um, I was playing semi-pro at the time, too, for football. And, yeah, go Eagles. And um, – I had to make a decision. My team was going to go to, I think we made it to like a championship game or something. And I had to make the decision, like, am I going to kick, you know, my senior year of college or am I going to go with this team that actually lets me play to like a championship game? So. Okay. Yeah. So sorry. Went off on a tangent there. No, you're good. No, no. <laughs> That's obviously it was a different dynamic going from soccer to football and, to be able to play both sports simultaneously definitely had to be a little bit of a toll on, on your body physically, I would think, right? Yeah, um, it wasn't as much of a toll as I thought it was going to be. But um, I think the biggest thing was, um, like, especially in college when I was playing both sports during the same season, I would literally have to run from soccer practice over to football to make special teams practice and a little bit of their conditioning and then run back to soccer. And so it was like, I'd go from like, maybe we were taking, you know, like shooting on the goal and like needing to score, you know, under the, and then I'd run over to kick for football. And then I'm like, all right, I gotta adjust everything. And I think that was, and then um, like freshman year of football too, I went from high school kicking off of a block to like kicking off of the ground. And that transition was probably the hardest thing I've ever had to figure out. Um, it took a long, you know, longer than I thought it was going to get kicking better from high school to college. Yeah, well, you know, that the condition, like, you know, just to go a little further about that, you know, Andrew, you were talking about, I could definitely tell you that uh, blitz practices, Julie definitely was right there. She did all the conditioning with the defense, the the ladder drills and everything and running, okay. running nonstop. 
Yeah. Vince, was it you that said the um the Julie clause? Like at one it was, it was the Julie clause. If if they if anybody had said they couldn't do ladders, if Julie was out there doing them and doing the agility drills, they could be out there doing them too. Use that as a motivator, eh? Absolutely. I thought there was a time too where um you were like, all right, no more soccer games before practice or something. Yeah, it was. I, I, don't know, I don't know if you hurt your hamstring or what, but you know, when we first started, you know, it was, it was everyone was just, hey, let's see how far this goes. And as we started winning more games, it was like, wait, 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 we got a real shot here, Julie. You got to stop playing soccer. You got, we got to protect you. You can't, uh, you know, no, no, no hurting those hamstrings, no overstretching them. You just got to just focus on kicking now. <laughs> I had the when we were. Um, what was that place in Elgin called? Intra Sports. Intra Sports. So it had the best setup when we were at Intra because there was a soccer league that practiced right before our football practice started. And they invited me to like come practice with them. So I would show up to football practice like two hours before it started so I could practice with this soccer team. And like, I don't know. I remember getting to practice. We got there <laughs> early for something one time and somebody's doing something. And all of a sudden there goes Julie running by on a soccer field. And we're like, <laughs> What the hell is going on right now? <laughs> what are you doing? We got the <laughs> free workouts. So, right. so oh, you, you played indoor, you played outdoor. What's a little bit of difference that went into your, you know, you specialize in kicking and special teams. What was a little bit difference between the indoor versus the outdoor? Um, indoor, like for the leagues that we were in, um, I think the hardest – or the biggest difference was the different venues that we played at and the ceiling heights. Um, because you'd have some places where you had tons of space to kick and you didn't have to worry about your football hitting the ceiling or hitting a rafter or something. And then our home, like our home field, for example, I loved playing there. Um, oh, I'm drawing a blank on it. Uh, Odium? Yeah, the Odium. It was super tricky to kick at because there were like lights and like, bars and stuff that hung down so you literally had to like get enough height on your ball to like clear the line in front of you but then you had to keep it low enough and like line drove enough to not hit the ceiling because if it hit the ceiling it was ruled like no good and it could have been like the best perfect straightest kick and like no doubt it was going to go down the middle but it hit the ceiling so no good so I think that was like the biggest difference from you know, all the space in the world outdoor and then all these different like indoor places that had no space. Yeah, we had, it was funny, Andrew. There was like she was saying the the lights hanging down. They had these cages around them, and every okay. practice we'd have to see at the end how many footballs we lost because she kicked it hard enough that it would literally go right through the rungs on the cage and it would stay in the cage. And they were hanging <laughs> by the light. So it was hanging above the – you'd come on game day. You'd look up, oh, there's a ball, there's a ball, there's one over there. And they were, like, right in front of, like, the – if you the have – post. Pick. So, right. yeah. Okay. <laughs> I, I can imagine – I can imagine that was uh, probably a little bit difficult to adjust to at first just with that ceiling height, like you said, and – having to go from being outside and you don't have to worry about anything like that to, okay, it's no good. If I hit the ceiling, I've really got to focus in and kind of almost retrain your foot in that aspect. Yeah. And just even like more like of the, I think the line drive was hardest because adjusting to it, like sometimes like during practice, you know, if you line drive it too hard, you don't get like the jump on the ball. You'd hit your teammates in the back or in the butt, and they'd be like, "What the hell?" You know, like, <laughs> "Damn it, Julie!" <laughs> you see people laying on the ground. She's kicking them in the head. <laughs> uh, they only have like once. <laughs> so, Julie, what are you up to nowadays? Um, nowadays I, my full-time job, I work for an intellectual property law firm in Chicago. Um, I do their graphic design work and then, um, for fun, like on the side I have, I do, um, graphic design for, I call it Harsh Elements and it's like my own little graphic design company and I do like freelance projects and stuff. Okay. Very cool. Very cool. Uh, one thing I wanted to touch on is I know you've uh, been a big part in the Laces Out Foundation, right? Um, I wouldn't say a big part. 
Um, but I was invited to be a coach for them for their first camp that they had. And unfortunately, I wasn't able to make it. Um, but they had, they had a really good camp and they're um, looking forward to having more camps. I think they're going to have one in August. Hopefully I'll be able to be at that one. But okay. that's cool. They're, um, they specialize in helping women advance in sports, specifically football. And their last camp, I don't know if they do this with every camp, but their last camp, they partnered with uh, the Dump Project. And uh, the Dump Project helps, um, like, helps fight against human trafficking and that type of stuff. Okay. Very cool. Uh, yes, that's definitely, the Laces Out Foundation is definitely something that needs to get some attention nationally. So I'm glad that we got to have you on here uh, to share your perspective with that. I mean, it's obviously uh, you as a female player, as Vince said, had quite a long career compared to other female athletes. And that's a stigma that we'd like to see change moving forward. So definitely uh, goes a long way when female athletes do support and mentor each other in that regard. Yeah, definitely. So when you see, you know, we see as especially, you know, like Andrew was saying, you see more and more women involved in sports now and, you know, coaches in the NFL and different things. You know, how does it, how does it feel? Just talk a little bit about to, how it feels to have be the first, you know, the first woman to have to score a field or sorry, kick a field goal in professional football. Um, I mean, it feels pretty cool. Um, I actually just uh, – this one girl, I think she's – or not girl, woman in California, um, she's writing her senior uh, journalist paper, and she asked if she could interview me for it. And um, okay. she – asked that same question and then was like, you know, what did you think when you did that? And like, I had no idea I did that until I saw it on Wikipedia. Otherwise I would have never known. Like, I just didn't like, you know, cause like you see girls out there doing stuff and you're just like, okay, cool. Or, you know, don't think about it. And then, so yeah, I had no idea that. Cool. I like it. Wow. So that actually makes it a little bit more special for you at the time. You didn't even realize I would say the significance of what was happening. And then you go, how, however long after that, you go and look at Wikipedia and you see that, hey, I've got this alkylate that I'm going to carry for the rest of my life. I mean, that's absolutely amazing. Yeah, it's, it's cool. <laughs> it's definitely a cool thing. So I got to ask. You, you played soccer and you played football at the same time. If you If you could only choose one, What's your favorite sport and why? Oh man, I do both. I love both. <laughs> like that was a question she asked too, and it was like if I would have focused on one or the other, I probably wouldn't be, been able to do better at one or the other. Like especially in college, I'm playing like <laughs> take it easy, Gus. Gus going crazy. <laughs> um, but I love both sports so much, and I couldn't possibly like choose to play just because they're so different and like. I don't know. They're yeah. I don't think I could choose one or the other. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. You know, it's hard to, especially when you see, you know, it. Especially you've made your career in playing football, and then when people start to research you and see different things about you, it's like you know to see that you actually started playing soccer, and you know to find out you were actually playing in soccer leagues the same time you were playing professional football, and just one of those things you're you constantly you know, uh, tied to both. Yeah. Got to keep moving. <laughs> so who do you follow as far as sports teams? Uh, let's go with, let's go with the NFL. Who do you follow in the NFL? Are you a bears fan? No, I love the Packers. Oh, I asked the wrong question, Vince. <laughs> you did. As soon as, as soon as you started asking, I was like, Oh man. <laughs> well, Hey, that's okay. I mean, Obviously, the Bears and the Packers have had a great historic rivalry, and it's something that I look forward to seeing every year. So to each their own, obviously, Vince and I are Bears fans, but can't hold it against you. The Packers have had some great players historically. So I'm so tired of hearing about the Packers. <laughs> so I got to go to a game one time, and I was like five feet away from Mason Crosby. <laughs> 
I got to be like um, Lisa Salter's. Uh, you know how to hold up like the the nice light stuff to make yeah. her face look nice and everything. I got to be her person, like holding her light. <laughs> we were on the Packers sideline, and uh, Mason was like warming up. So I have like a really good creepy picture of me like watching him kick. <laughs> it's funny because you always hear people talk about the Packers and it's Aaron Rodgers, Aaron Rodgers, Aaron Rodgers, and you come on and you're like, man, I was so close to Mason Crosby. <laughs> well, I was, I was not, I was pretty close to Aaron Rodgers too, and he, the game that I was at on the like actually staying on the sidelines, he was out with an injury. I think he that was where he injured his shoulder. Um, yeah, it was when the Bears dumped him on his shoulder. Yeah, I um, do remember that. He was there, but he um, was there like he wasn't dressed or anything. But he was so tall, like all those dudes were so tall. But they, you know, with cleats on, like it probably makes him a little taller. And you know, because the guys that were on our team were super tall too. That's probably right. it's always funny to see you know football players, or athletes in general, in person versus you know what you see on TV. Like I was a kid, we were on vacation. I'll never forget. We went to uh, Toronto. And we got a tour of the locker rooms and the Raptors had played at the Sky Dome for one year before the Air Canada Center was open. And the Bulls played there, so they had Jordan's locker, like, encased in glass. It was really cool. But I was young. We were walking through, and the guy's giving us a tour. And I look up, and I'm like, oh, what is that stuff all the way up there? And he's like, that's the hand dryer. And I was like, why is it so tall? And he was like, you got seven feet tall guys. He's like, they don't need to bend over to, to dry their hands. They need it up by where they are. I was like, oh, my God. <laughs> yeah that's something uh i actually had the privilege to be on field at soldier field a couple years ago to help hold the american flag before a bears game and awesome. that was that was something that was kind of surreal for me as a fan being out there on the field and seeing those guys at eye level so to speak and you realize okay some some of these guys are a little bit bigger than they look on tv and it was cool to get to interact with some players. Uh, I didn't get to interact with any of the Bears players. The Bears were playing the Chargers that day, so I did get to high-five a couple Chargers players. But just to look up and see that stadium and see what it looks like to have, you know, 40,000-plus people looking down at you, is a, it's a surreal feeling. So I can definitely understand that. Yeah, that would definitely be cool. So, Julie, you've done a lot of camps and clinics and different things. And what is it, you know, what what's the best part or how does it feel to, you know, be doing those and have younger girls and kids, all, you know, in general, but especially younger girls come up to you, you know, and have you as an in, somebody of inspiration or somebody they want to be like as they grow up? Uh, it's, it's pretty cool. And I never thought I'd be, like, in that position to, you know, like, be giving advice and stuff for, like, sports. Um, and, you know, like now that I'm not playing on teams, like I don't have you know, the, the kids or athletes coming up to me after games, but like on Instagram and Twitter, I have, um, different athletes reaching out and it's pretty cool. Cause like, sometimes it's not even, you know, like younger girls reaching out. Sometimes it's like, you know, like boys, like, Hey, like I saw you kick, like, you know, stuff like that. So it's pretty neat that it's like, it's not just, I don't know. It's like all, all athletes, like, uh, it's cool. Very cool. So how do people find you on Instagram and Twitter? I'm sorry. What's that? People like fans that want to follow you. How do they find you on Twitter and Instagram? Um, on Twitter, it's Julie harsh 99. And my Instagram handle is just Julie harsh. And then my graphic design inst Instagram handle is harsh elements design. Perfect. Okay. Well, Julie, we appreciate all the time you gave us. You were a great interview, a lot of cool insights about, you know, kicking and the world of sports and everything. So we appreciate you coming on and giving us that time and taking the time out of your night. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me on your show. Awesome. Oh, absolutely. We appreciate it, Julie. We'll talk soon. You take care. Okay. Thanks, Thanks Julie. Bye. Man, that was a, what a great interview. That was an excellent interview. A uh, lot of insight there as far as, you know, the transition from soccer to football is one that I can't imagine was easy. You know, she said that it wasn't as difficult as she thought. But, you know, from from my perspective, I would think that 
it would be a little bit tougher than, you know, she made it seem, but it was a great interview, great insight there. I mean, you can't, you can't beat having, you know, the first female athlete to kick a field goal in professional football. That's huge. Right. Well, yeah, you know, and like you said, to just to follow up what you said, you know, she said that it wasn't wasn't as hard, and is that can you imagine? You know, you're playing professional football, and then at the on your on your nights off, you're playing in indoor soccer leagues. And so, man, those indoor soccer leagues, they're they're just as competitive. You know, they they're running up and down the whole time. They're a lot more energy being spent. They they play just as hard, and you know, to be playing both at the same time. And then even to go back as far as college, be playing on both at the same time, you know, you, uh, you, you know, she obviously got the scholarship for soccer, but then to, you know, like she said, accidentally start playing football. And then all these years later, be like you said, the first to ever do something. Anytime you're the first to ever do something that is like noteworthy and like, you know, that people take notice of that's, I mean, I obviously don't know, but it's gotta be a cool feeling. Right. I mean, it's something that will never be taken away from her in that case. But real quick, guys, that interview with Julie was brought to us by the Jonathan Darren team uh, with the Coldwell Banker Real Estate Group. So we're going to take a second to play a quick clip from them. Hi, I'm Jonathan Darren, licensed real estate broker with Cobble Banker Real Estate Group in Homer Glen. Are you looking to buy or sell? Have you been disappointed in the past? The Jonathan Darren team with Cobble Banker Real Estate Group focuses on providing you with a concierge level of service during the process of buying or selling. We are a service-oriented team with a fresh and professional approach to selling real estate. Our goal is to combine knowledge, skills, and passion to exceed our clients' expectations, and most of all, we truly care. We are a knowledgeable real estate team focused on offering expertise and innovative solutions for our clients. The Jonathan Darren team has five full-service real estate brokers and a dedicated full-time marketer servicing all of Chicagoland. We will customize a detailed plan around your timeline for a sale, purchase, investment, estate, or other needs. Real estate transactions can be stressful, but don't need to be. Let us handle it for you. Visit our website, homesbyjdt.com, or call 708-308-1938 today. Expect better in real estate. Choose the Jonathan Darren team. That was a quick word from our sponsor, the Jonathan Darren team with the Coldwell Banker Real Estate Group. If you guys are looking to buy a home, they're the guys to go see. So Vince... We actually had to cut a couple topics short that I wanted to catch up on here before we wrap the show up. Uh, there was something big that happened in Chicago baseball the other night that we didn't get the chance to talk about. Uh, obviously, the Cubs haven't been doing anything, so we know we're not talking about them. Them damn Cubs. That, I mean, four hits in a game the other night, atrocious. Come on, you got to do better. See, I told you I was trying not to get upset tonight, and here you go bringing up the Cubs. Well, even in a topic that's not about the Cubs, you're trying to get me upset. Move, moving past the Cubs, the White Sox had a terrific game the other night. Uh, Carlos Rendon threw a no hitter, would have been a perfect game had it not been for a pitch that I believe hit the foot of another player. Yeah, and even that was that was bullshit. That guy. He, he just stood there. I didn't even know it hit him. They were like, really? That hit you? And I believe the comment after was, oh, I didn't know he was throwing a no-hitter. I didn't know he was going for – Come going on. To throw a perfect game. Him knew that he was throwing a no-hitter. You see I, you see him sitting by himself in the dugout, which actually is kind of cool. I heard Zach Collins is the catcher that caught it. He said that he was sitting by himself and Zach Collins was sitting by himself. Nobody would come talk to Zach Collins either. But you always hear about the pitchers. Nobody wanted to talk to him. I had no idea. And it makes total sense. You know, the catchers out there calling the, you know, calling the game. It didn't, it didn't even dawn on me that, hey, let's not bother the catcher either. Right. No, that is interesting. And, I mean, obviously, I, I believe that was the 20th no-hitter that was thrown in White Sox history. So, they've had a number of guys do it. But it is special, especially this early in a season, to see that and happen the fans for the back. Sox. And with fans back. I mean, that was the cool thing. You know, he did it at home. He did it with fans back. And it was two, the, the previous game, the two days before that, he was supposed to start and he, he was having stomach problems and couldn't, he was sick. He couldn't pitch. So Dallas Keiko wound up taking a start for him. And then two days later, he started instead and winds up throwing a no hitter. Oh, absolutely. I mean, obviously at the time, I'm sure he would have loved to be out there on the mound, but. 
I can't imagine the feeling that he had at that moment. Finally, I mean, that was a huge moment for him as a player. Obviously, he's had some some struggles with his body and stuff, staying healthy overall. Right. And, you know, just to be able to throw a no-hitter is something that so few guys get to do in their careers. I right. mean, it's it's more rare now than it has ever been with the way pitching has developed in the MLB. That's got to be huge for a guy, and especially this early in the season. I mean, the Sox, obviously, their bullpen is one of the best in baseball, and I think we've touched on that yeah. before, obviously, but it just goes to cement that. And then not only you had that amazing no-hitter, but you also had a game uh, with – Giolito out there that looked like a playoff baseball game, you know, and it just goes to show you that that bullpen really is tremendous. And if that team can consistently hit moving forward, that Sox team is going to be a hard team to stop. I mean, uh, I've, I've heard a lot of guys saying that they see him getting to 90 wins. And if, if the hitting's on and they stay consistent with the bullpen, I surely think they have a chance to do that. I mean, You've got guys, even just uh, guys in smaller roles like Michael Kopech is in a limit, more limited role for now, and he's absolutely strived so far this season. So, yeah, really- he's, looked, he's looked really good out there. Um, you know, and I heard it best today on the radio. They say everybody's gonna, every team in the majors, they're gonna win sixty games, they're gonna lose sixty games. It's what they do with the other forty that determines everything else. Right, and I mean, obviously, we're still early in the season. It's April. There's a full season to be played here, guys. And that's something that I think we need to remember moving forward is this isn't your truncated season. This is a full 162 game season. Let them go out there, let them play, let them work through some of these growing pains that they're going to have. Let them get used to having Tony LaRusa as a manager. Obviously a lot. That's a significant change for a young core. I mean, obviously this team has said that they're behind him. These young guys are, all in on La Russa, and it's going to be some development no matter what they say. I think there's obviously going to be some growing pains with him as a manager, just with the way he handles his rotation and things like that. You know, he's not as keen on some of the newer baseball technology, so that's going to play a, a factor into these early games moving forward as he gets himself acclimated to baseball in 2021, because realistically it's not the same game that it was years ago when he was managing those teams that he won world series with and things like that. Well, and it's easy for everyone to say, you know, all the right things when they're winning, it'll be when they have those, those 10 game stretches where to go two and eight, five and five, something like that, where then it now, are you guys, do you still, are you still fully behind them? But like you said, we got a few topics that we didn't get to. I want to actually bring on some extra firepower here to help us get through these last few topics here. And, you know, go over everything, and that's our boy from 1252, Angelo Ace Camacho. Angelo, what's up? What's up? Look, it, excellent I'm show, to excellent good. show. A regular on the show here. I like it. I like it a lot. You guys having I, me on, it's a, it's a fun time whenever the three of us get together and two, yeah, get to chat. Absolutely. Oh, absolutely. So, I'm Angelo, you know, let me man. real quick talk to you guys. That interview you guys just did, it's fucking great, man. Nothing like – if I have a daughter, I want her to be somebody like that that, that goes out there and just knocks doors down for right. women in sports. And and that's awesome interview, guys. It was great. Well, we appreciate oh, that. You know, Julie's a great interview. And like yeah. you said, it's, anytime you could talk to somebody who was the first to do something like of, you know, you know, something of importance and significant, it's just so rare that you actually get to yeah. talk to those people, you know, and I, I was lucky enough that, you know, I was working for the team, one of the teams she played for for years. So I got to talk to her on a regular basis and just kind of hear the stories and learn who she was as a person. And, you know, she was a lot of I don't want to take anything away from anybody. But sometimes when something when you're, you know, the the rare part becomes, well, it, it's all you think about. And to right. her, it, you when you talk to her, you you right away, you get that feel. It's not even on her mind. It's just you know, just another, just another thing for her. So that's, hell yeah. That's awesome. Absolutely. That's one, that's one thing I can definitely say about that interview is I got the most humble, you know, 
the most humble vibe, so to speak, from her, especially when she said she didn't even realize that she was the first female to kick right. a field goal professionally until she looked on Wikipedia. I mean, that's absolutely huge. It's, yeah. And it's a record she'll hold, Can you imagine obviously. you're sitting at home and you're just touching up on your Wikipedia and, you know, all of a sudden you look, you're like, no shit, really? <laughs> Can you imagine having a Wikipedia? Oh, right. <laughs> or <laughs> right. Having a Wikipedia like, oh, mine would be like Angelo Camacho, the jackass who hosts with Mike uh, with Fat Mike on Wednesday nights. <laughs> That's what I would say. So, uh, boys, I was at work today, and I got out of work, and I could not get home fast enough. You know, I like to prep for the shows on Friday, but I had to take a little break. The new MLB The Show 21 came out today. Well, the pre-orders came pre-orders, out. Pre-orders, right. And I had to had to get on there and play it. It's dope, just like it is every year. But, Angel, you, why don't you tell us you got something going on on your Twitter account right now, don't you? Yeah, man. Uh, so we're trying to build this 1252 brand. We're trying to build all the guys involved in it, um, myself included. Uh, my my Twitter is at SportCoreAC, all one word, all lowercase. Um, once I reach up to that 200 follower mark, I'm going to be giving away a free copy of MLB The Show to whatever system uh, one lucky person decides to get it for. So, That's very cool. That's very cool, man. That yeah. game, you know, it's always a hot game, especially that this game year, is one right? of that. That game is my favorite game to play on PlayStation. Yeah, well, that's what started me with PlayStation was like you could only play it if you had PlayStation. This right. is the first year right. that Xbox is going to be able to play, and they're going to have the cross platform for the that's next even better. To play yep. each other, which is even better. Yep. But so I was I was doing some research, and you said two hundred. I saw you were at one hundred and sixty eight. Yep. We're thirty two followers away from somebody getting a copy of the game. And on behalf of our show here, we want to go ahead and do the same thing for you. If we you hit 200, we're going to go ahead and pick a second person, and we're going to supply them with a game as well. Yo, that's what's up. That's awesome. That's like one out of 100. You got a chance. Be right. one of the 200, you get two chances to win right. a game. Absolutely. That's what's up. Yeah, you hell know, yeah. And, oh, absolutely. And, and the best part is you know, some of the people, you know, they like you said, only 32. 32 yep. people is all we need. So yep. for everyone watching, it's 32 people. As soon as it hits 200, we're going to pick two people, and they're going to get the games. Yeah, it's real simple, man. Just go to Twitter, type in the little search bar, the little at sign, S-P-O-R-T-C-O-U-R-T-A-C. Boom, that's I was, it. I was so waiting for you to misspell that. Nah, <laughs> I, I, I've spelled it all right here. Actually, I could even change my name on here. Just there so you people go. can see how to spell it the right way. Hold on, Absolutely. give me 30 seconds. I don't want to have no air, dead air time. Right. <laughs> Angelo's coming in here with another fire headband, I do Boom. just have to say. Right. He's right. This, is, uh, this is the 90s throwback headband that I that I just I was going to say, Trump that's... So did, you, did you wear a headband with, for the McMahon interview? I did. I started out wearing a headband for Joe. And I was going to wear my DILF headband. For yeah. the week before with Pat Boyle, I thought it was a little immature, even though it just stands for a devoted, involved, loving father. But, you know, people, they have their minds in a gutter. So I, I was going to wear my headband. <laughs> and then I decided, well, Jim McMahon's coming out. We're talking to Yurko. I'll wear my Bears hat. Wear my Bears hat. Then we did our little pro- our, uh, the promo for our sponsor. Came back. I had the, the Jim McMahon sweatband with the 1252 on it you know it's a little homage to to the super bowl winning punky qb <laughs> very um, cool very cool man that interview is just taking off um yeah man I, I i don't know if i've ever been a part of anything that blew up that fast in my entire life that was positive yeah <laughs> like, <laughs> that was positive. usually if it's if it's going that fast it's something b- very bad right um but yeah i mean it, it, we didn't even get into that conversation to have those be his answers. You know right. what I mean? Like we were just curious right. who, you, who he thought the bear should take, mm-hmm. um, you know, what it was like playing for green Bay and the bears. And then we talked about how he wore a bears Jersey to the white house. Um, it, it was a fun interview, man. We also had Yurko on and, and you guys, I know, listen to ESPN 1000 yeah. all the time. Like we do. And oh, yeah. uh, Yurko's the man funny as hell. Yeah. Uh, that might have been one of the, uh, the 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 best shows we've done uh, for twelve fifty two. Jim McMahon, I, I, 
my dad called me afterwards. He was like, I can't believe you got to interview my favorite Bears player of all time. And I was like, of all time? He's like, okay, okay, besides Walter. I was like, that's what I thought, man. Like, who who says Jim McMahon is their favorite player on the Bears right. of all time? <laughs> right. But my dad is kind of a, a little punky QB in his own self. So he, he okay. I think that's why he kind of liked the Jimmy Mack a little bit more than others. So, but – where were we? We were on TMZ, ESPN 1000, CBS, uh, Fox News. Fox. All, all over ESPN TV. ESPN TV. Yeah, we were on First Take. We were on Pardon, Pardon uh, PTI. Yep. It was uh, Stephen A. All of Stephen that. Stephen A. Yeah. And they even talked about it today on ESPN 1000 on Cap and J Hood and Carmen and Yurko. So, I mean, that's such a crazy thing to, you know, an interview that you're a part of. And next thing you know, Stephen A. Smith is talking about it. <laughs> yeah. When uh, <laughs> we all do our little group message, right? And, and right. Alan sent a picture message to the group of ESPN um, something detail or, or well, assignment detail it was the assignment desk yeah yeah had, assignment desk, that's what it was can somebody can you follow us so we can send you a direct message yeah uh, my first thought i don't mean to interrupt you no my go first ahead thought when he sent that i was like uh-oh what did we do yep that's we what i thought too. Yep. <laughs> we're about to get in trouble <laughs> yep i thought they were gonna be like i can't believe you had yurko on to right. talk this and that and i was like that's oh, exactly shit. what i thought it was gonna be, they were gonna be like, it was either that be. or they were gonna offer all of us contracts to go be on espn <laughs> one of the two and uh neither of them happened but you know they, they asked for permission to put that clip of uh jim with me and mike on and and no joke it was one of the best moments of my uh probably of my life. This is something I've always wanted to do. Right. I know you two are the same way. Uh, just getting to bullshit sports with your friends and, and guys that you respect getting to talk to, I mean, Jim McMahon, the only quarterback to win a Super Bowl for the Chicago bears, my number one favorite right. team of all my Chicago sports teams. It was a dream come true. The momentum really started though, the week before with Hester, you yeah. know what I mean? We, we talked about that oh, earlier. Absolutely. It's been, you know, I said it's been banger after banger. You guys started with Hester. You know, you had Pat Boyle, then Hester, then you know now they had D'Lo Brown with, on here. Right, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. and then we followed up D'Lo with you guys having Jim McMahon yep. and uh, and Yurko on. You know, you're like you said, Yurko's a great interview too. So yep. you could just show it just had him, but then you factor in Jim McMahon, and then to go into then what became from that interview yeah. that nobody had any idea. When that interview was booked, we all thought, cool, man, it'd be cool to talk yeah. to, like you said, the only quarterback that's won a Super Bowl, and then it just skyrocketed from there. It so, shot up. Before we get anywhere else, we had a few topics you wanted to go over. The, the chat's got a few that we did earlier that they missed. Figured what better than bring a little extra firepower on and have you guys give your takes on them. Let's go, well, boys. Well, so, real quick, I just – I want to piss you off a little bit, Vince, and I want to move towards the Cubs for a second. So, wrong with you? So, did you guys catch the the interview uh, that came out with Contreras uh, after the game? After the game, just saying that. Oh, I think it was the wrong move to intentionally throw a pitch at him. I at the pitcher at the pitcher. pitcher, Yes, you. What are you thinking? You can't go on record saying that, whether that's your intention or not. You can't go out there and publicly say that to a reporter, be quoted right. saying it. Like and, that's, that's always been the thing, right? The unwritten rules of baseball. Right. And that's one of them. Like baseball is always able to, you know, kind of keep itself in balance. Right. And yeah, right. you could kind of tell that the Cubs were getting pissed off. Contreras has been hit a lot. I think it's been what nine, seven times in the last thirteen games. Like that's insane. Yeah, that is and, insane. And like, yeah, you you expect your guys to stand up for your players and throw the ball. He didn't hit the pitcher, which I think is it's bullshit that he got three game suspension for not hitting anybody. Right. I understand if he hit him, yeah, okay, I guess you could say intent was there. But Ross was pissed. Contreras, I I don't know. He should know better than that. Here's right. my thing. And it goes, there's a few years back. So before I get it, there's a few positions in sports that I feel like are just held different than everybody else. Quarterback in football. And when you talk about the quarterback, it's the off, how the offensive line protects their quarterback, not just playing, but just in general. Right. Base, you know, the hockey, the goalies, you don't touch the goalies. Right. 
different things. Baseball, the catchers always have the pitchers back. So it kind of goes a few years back. I remember I was watching a game in – I forget who the pitcher was for uh, the San Francisco Giants at the time. I think it might have been Hunter Strickland. I think it might have been. And he had thrown at somebody. They were going back and forth. And he threw at somebody, and the guy went out on a mound, and Buster Posey stood behind home plate. It never got in between them. So when you talk about catchers, it's not like, you know, um, I don't know who played second base that night for the Cubs, but it's not like an infielder or, you know, somebody who played the obvious. Like Ian Happ said, I, I don't think it was the right move. That's bad enough. But when it's the catcher, I mean, like you said, it's the under rules. The catcher is the one that protects everybody. He, right. He's the one. He right. put himself between the pitcher, the coach, and the other team. He basically was say, came out and said, well, it's not what I would have done. We only did it because the coach wanted to and totally threw everybody under the bus. And then we'll never know, but now you, you take it to another level. If he never says that, does anybody actually get suspended? Right, because that's what I was going to say. Yep. Yeah, exactly. Like, there was no intent if he doesn't open his mouth, right? Right. If it's, he doesn't exactly. say that, there's no way to prove pitch. that there was intent. Right. A exactly. A wild pitch. Do we as fans know, yeah, he threw at that guy? Of course we do. But there's no way to right. prove that he was aiming for him unless the guy who calls the pitches and where to throw them tells you, hey, we shouldn't have thrown at the pitcher. We should have threw at somebody else. Right. No, so, absolutely. I totally agree. So switching switching modes here a little bit, we had uh we had talked earlier when the show first started. Um, there was not breaking news at the time of the show, but earlier today, it was about a half hour before the show started that the Bears signed Marquise Goodwin. Yeah. Um, so we had a, one of our followers in the chat, Scott Rudin. He wanted us to discuss it, and Angela, I'd love your opinion on it. So. Marquise Goodwin, uh, he played for the uh, 49ers. I really liked him when he was on that team. Um, I think it's a smart play. All it cost you was money, right? Right. And that's right. what the Bears right now, they don't have a lot, but they have enough to get these third, fourth type of receivers that they need to fill out the roster, obviously. Mm -hmm. But also, he brings something to your offense that you've kind of lacked, and that's the speed aspect, right? He's somebody who you could probably throw into that slot position, Mm -hmm. Get get a little bit of separation, and then you know, a quick pass, boom, there's 20 yards, hopefully. You know what right. I mean? I think it's right. a good signing. What do you guys think? So we talked earlier, and we said the same thing. Um, I said the big thing it gives them is the vertical speed. Yeah. You know, they got a lot of guys that do kind of side to side, but he's got that vertical speed. You got him. You got Mooney. If they go draft one of these receivers in the third round or second round, you pair him with him. Now you've got a lot of speed to open things up for Allen Robinson. Um you know, and it can give somebody, it give Andy Dalton somebody to throw deep to. So to me, that signing, as small as it is, kind of signifies that I don't think the Bears are going to look for a wide receiver in the top top of the draft, first, second, maybe even fourth round. They might get one later, fifth, sixth round. I think that that's going to be their kind of, okay, we got this guy. He's the right. speed we need. We got Mooney. And we have Robinson. You also have Cole Komet, who you're hoping right. kind of takes that next step as a, right. at the tight end spot. As of now, they haven't gotten rid of Jimmy Graham, which I don't think they're going to unless they use him to trade. I think they're going to keep him on. I think yeah, he's a good I, I think if, presence. If they were going to, they would have already done that. Right. Yep, absolutely. And I think he's I think he's a good veteran presence. I think him and Andy Dalton, as much as I hate the signing of Andy Dalton, I think he gives him experience in the huddle that he needs. Right. You know what I mean? Um, mm -hmm. Hopefully, the Bears are smart in this draft. I don't know if they will be. Um, <laughs> I'd love to see them take, like Mike and I, you know, we argue back and forth on what the Bears should do and what we think the Bears will do. Um, the Bears right. should draft O-line, right? That's We can mm -hmm. all agree on that. Absolutely. Absolutely. I don't think they're going to. I think <laughs> they're going to do some stupid stuff, maybe trade – Anthony Miller and the first round to move up a little bit, probably go after Mac Jones. You know, uh, that's right. That, that's what I think. I, I don't want them to. I'd rather them take a pass on him, get somebody in the third round, maybe even later, and just just ride it out with Dalton at this point, man. Like you're not going to win the Super Bowl right either way. Right. Right. So draft a guy if he's if he works cool. If not. 
take your record this year and look to next year? I think the only way the Bears move up to four is if San Francisco takes Mac Jones. Yeah. I think they have way more interest in Justin Fields and Trey Lance than they do Mac Jones. So I think if, you know, now it's now everybody, you know, and we're not going to know until draft day actually gets here, but now they're saying San Francisco is probably going to go Justin Fields, not Mac Jones. Right. We right. won't know, but I, I, you know, I hope, like you said, I hope the Bears just do the smart thing. I hope they stay at 20. They take the offensive lineman, um, you know, or it's just like a first round pick at Anthony Miller. Like you said, they're not right, giving just up. To, yeah. Or you're not yeah. giving up everything to move up just a few spots right because what but good does it do to to give away this year's first to move up right but then not only that but then next year's first and they'd probably have to give up substantial right later round picks in yeah. following years and that's where as much as i hate to say it that's where ryan pace does his best work is Absolutely. The later rounds right mm-hmm. and right. With the, we've talked about this before with the dalton signing i don't see this being a one and done season for Pace and Nagy. Right. I see it being as they're going to allow Nagy to pick a quarterback that he wants, and that's why I think they're going to do whatever they have to do to get that quarterback. So I think I think they're going to look to move up to get the quarterback that they want. I don't think they should, but but Andrew, what do you think? I I do have to agree. I don't think that it's something they should do, but obviously we saw that Matt Nagy was at both the first and second day of Justin Fields' yep. pro day. Uh, and, you know, it's a very Ryan Pace move. It's a very Ryan Pace move to move up for a guy that – I Justin Fields is anything but a sure thing for the right. NFL, in my opinion. So it's a very Ryan Pace move to say, okay, here's a guy that I like. Obviously, he's going to go in the in the top five. There's not – there's not a whole bunch of depth at quarterback beyond, you know, those first four to five guys, really. Right. So moving forward, I think this year, as far as the depth goes at quarterback, it's obviously a little little lax after those first five guys. You're looking at, you know, some second and third round potential guys that may get picked. But it's when the one of the guys in the top five, I would say two, because Mac Jones isn't a sure thing in my opinion either when nor is Trey Lance. Right. Honestly, if you really think about it, Trevor Lawrence, nobody is a for sure thing, right? We all right. think that Trevor Lawrence is going to come in and be this superstar. Right. You know what I mean? Because that's what the draft experts say. That's right. what we've seen in college. He struggled in the championship game. Let's not forget. You know what right. I mean? He had some good plays, right. but he definitely struggled in that game. I don't know if it was, you know, he looked past it because he expected to go to the draft. You know what I mean? Like, like you're a wrestling fan, Vince. So, so you talk about like, uh, you know, maybe they look to the next match type of mm-hmm. thing. Maybe he was looking towards the draft instead of being, yeah. hey, this is where I'm at in the moment. I, I don't think any of these guys are for sure thing. And the worst part is, is next year's quarterback draft is it's supposed to so be bad. terrible. Even right. worse, yeah. Right. That's why I think the Bears are going to do whatever they have to do to get to where they need to get to get the quarterback they need. So, Angelo, two things. One, yeah. with you bringing up Trevor Lawrence and the, the struggles he's had, did you if you did you get any or see the, the interview he had, I believe it was with Sports Illustrated? I think it came out last week and when he was talking about his mentality coming in and how – <clears throat> they talk about a lot of guys coming with chips on their shoulders and something to prove and looking to, to shut up all the haters. And he, I did not see that. So he came out, he told sports illustrated, he's actually the opposite. They, they talked about his motivation to come in and he said, well, actually he said, I'm not one of those guys. I don't have a chip on my shoulder. I'm not looking to prove anybody wrong. I'm just, I love football. I love playing. I'm coming in to compete and be the best I can be, but I'm not really looking to prove anybody wrong or, have that chip on my shoulder that's going to make me motivate me to play better right. than I'm already looking to play. So a lot of people have picked up this story nationally talking about, you know, is there a, is there a, a passion issue? Is he not as into football as, you know, you would want your starting quarterback to be? Can he lead a team? All these different things now have spun off it. Obviously there's no way Jacksonville doesn't draft it. Right. <clears throat> I, None. I can't see any possible. Unless they scenario. trade out. 
and just take right. a shitload haul from, from that number one. Pick. How could you? I can't see Urban Meyer passing on him. Right, right. I That's just, the thing. You know, I just can't see it. So obviously he's going to go number one, but it's just, you know, it's one of those things. It's interesting to hear all the stuff that comes out around draft time. Mm-hmm. You know, the, the, was it? Oh, it was uh, Laramie Tunsil when he got drafted by Miami. Yeah. The thing with his yeah. dad and all this, all the, you know, you always hear this weird stuff come out around draft time. You never know what's going to fall. And that's it, to bring all this back together. Is, that's why I say I, I hope the Bears don't go crazy and all in to move up because all it takes is for that one guy to fall. And now you've got, you know, Trey Lance or Justin Fields at 20. If they get Trey Lance or Mac right. Jones or somebody at 20, yeah, if, 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 if one do, of those guys are there, give up anything but that one pick to go get that quarterback. Right. If if right. those guys are there at twenty, as much as I want an offensive lineman, you kind of have to let Nagy decide. Okay, I can do something with one of these guys. You right. know what I mean? Exactly. Right. And I, think- I would I would be happy if the Bears, honestly, with how deep this draft is with offensive line, is if one of those top five quarterbacks is completely out of the question. I would not be upset to see them trade back mm-hmm. to gain Absolutely. more draft okay. capital. You know what I mean? Maybe especially jump back to the how, 25. Especially, especially depending how the draft goes before them. Right. You know, right. if a couple linemen that you figured would be gone at 20 are both still there or a couple of them are still there, now, like you said, you can move back to 20, 20 or mm-hmm. 25, 27. You could gain some more picks and really not lose anything because right. there's so many good linemen there. Um, you know, and that, it's like the, like you said, with the Marquise Goodwin signing, it gives them more flexibility. Yep. They're not locked into having to take a wide receiver now, you know, and you, they do have some money. They're not locked into having to take alignment. If, if they get, you know, if they trade back and they get alignment at 27 and they go spend some money and they go sign Mitchell Schwartz to play right tackle. Right. Now you've just got two stud tackles and maybe it wasn't the left tackle you really wanted, but you got more picks to get more players later, and you can still go get a Mitchell Schwartz. Right. So, and you um, got Charles Leno off the field. Yeah. Man. Right. Yeah. Charles Leno was that just was a, was a liability. That you know was what I, mean? the right. I said earlier. Angela, I told, I told Andrew, I said, you know, we all talk a lot of shit about Ryan Pace. I said, if in one offseason he's able to get rid of Mitch Trubisky, uh, Anthony Miller, in my mind, Tariq Cohen, and Charles Leno. I'm, I might have to start being a Ryan Pace fan. I don't know. I just think it's weird that th- who they signed, Damian Williams, right? Damian Williams. Last time I think it's weird the that they sign him. Now they got him, Cohen, and Montgomery, right? Yeah. Right. That's a crowded backfield. It's a crowded backfield. And I, like I said, the, my, my thing with Tariq Cohen is one, he's proven he's not durable, which right, right. everybody knew with his size. Right. And two, right. He, he doesn't have that elite speed. He's not like a – they keep saying, well, he could be like Tariq Hill. Well, Tariq Hill doesn't get caught from behind. Every time Tariq right. Cohen breaks through the line and he gets somewhere, he gets caught from behind. I think they see him like a Darren Sproles, behind. right? Because, like, right. Nagy came from Philly. Didn't they have Darren Sproles there yes. with him for yeah. a while? Yeah. I don't see – he doesn't have the speed like Darren Sproles. No, no, he doesn't. Sproles was fast, and, and he was elusive, and he could hit those gaps where he needed to. I, I don't see Tariq being that same way. Tariq Cohen, Adam Shaheen, they were guys that Ryan Pace thought he was smarter than everybody else. He <laughs> found them at a small school, got them later in the draft, and said these guys are going to be building blocks, and neither of them are. Right. Right. I mean, uh, honestly, if you look at, at Pace's – I don't want to go go into it. That's It's a seven-show ordeal. But if you look right. at all of Ryan Pace's draft picks as a whole, right, mm-hmm. there's maybe – five guys maybe that are like, okay, those are great picks. Those are right. good picks. You know what I mean? You got what? Roquan. Roquan. Um, I mean, Adrian Amos was a good pick. Right. But he didn't, they didn't resign him. Right. So that does nothing for you. Right. You know what I mean? Absolutely. And right. Darnell Mooney, it looks like he's going to be one of those guys. So with Anthony Miller. Right. That's right. Exactly. It, you know, I, I don't know. I just think it's. Cr- I wish I could be as bad at my job as the, as he is, and make the money he makes right. and still have a job because it, right. it, it's insane. with no with no pressure at all. Like right, right. It's not like you're. It's not like he's looking over his shoulder. We've talked about it a lot. He's not looking over his shoulder at. Hey, this guy's here. That guy's there. What you know? I might lose my job if I do this. Um, you know, it also came out that the Bears are one of a handful of teams that are still in contact. Still with for Houston. Watson. Yeah. You know, I, I don't know if he gets moved. 
Um, you know, we don't like to go into a lot of things here. His case is what it is, but you know, it looks like uh, the the uh, front office people around the league. They said they obviously didn't say who it was, but a right. person said they don't expect to see any any criminal charges. Right, it's all civil. It's all just going to stay civil. Which usually, I, like like I'm 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 all for getting all the facts before right. you make a decision, right? And it was not looking good for a while there, right? Right. You get all these lawsuits, one on top of the other, on top right. of the other. I think that it's going to end up being something where it's going to be settled. Yeah, he'll play. The NFL won't bring any suspensions on him. Right? Uh, is that the right play? Who knows? Right. Only right. Who only knows one person right knows the real truth of what happened. Well, right. Technically, two people it would right. be him and the and the woman. Right. Right. Nobody else right. will know exactly what happened. Nobody else should think that they know what happened. Right. right? I think I don't think it's stupid for the Bears to sniff around. No, if I you mean, could get him for especially if for whatever reason that you get him for just a little bit less than what you might have had to give up before, right? Like if you were willing to give up all that for Russell Wilson, who's 32 years old, and then fast forward to a couple days, you know, draft week. Now as you're getting closer to the draft, and Houston needs those picks, and they, what are we going to do? I mean, they did just give Trod Taylor thirteen million, so mm-hmm. that doesn't speak back up to me when you start giving guys thirteen million. You're right, but then you say, right. okay, well, we were going to give up these three first round picks and blah 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 for a thirty two year old Russell Wilson. We definitely will give that up for a twenty six year old or twenty five year old Deshaun Watson. Right, so, as long as the legal be, stuff is behind him. Correct, correct. And I would be, you know, much more inclined to give up that much when it comes to the draft and stuff for Deshaun Watson, you know, obviously if he is going to play, if his name is cleared of this situation, right, you know, right. we can't speculate at this point, what's going to happen. We have to follow the due process and see what the end result is. But realistically, if he's a guy that's able to play and, you know, this gets put behind him, I would, I would throw the farm at him and I'd be okay doing that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah like yeah. I would rather do that than, then the Bears move up for a guy that's not – that they don't right. know. You know what I mean? Right. At least you and, know right. what you're getting out of Deshaun Watson. Right. You know who he is. He's shown you with a bad Houston team what he can do. Right. Imagine what he could do with this Bears but team. It, right? And wouldn't it be the most Ryan Pace move of all Ryan Pace moves to to give up the entire – you know, the, the entire cupboard, everything you've got, you give all that up to trade for the quarterback that you should have taken in the draft? That, that would be – uh, poetic justice is right. that the, you know what I mean? Like right. we could have had we could have had Deshaun, but he was too. I love Mitch to right. to, to, to even even take him on a I private. Mean, even workout, John Fox you know knew I mean? that was the right move. Everybody knew. Everybody knew that Deshaun Watson was the safest quarterback yeah, I mean, pick in you, that. You draft, don't play right? that well back to back years against Alabama's defense and say right. well, they, they might be okay. Right. <laughs> I <laughs> so Why did go there. We're just gonna get upset again, yeah, right? The Bears piss right. me off all the time, and now I see why Jim really doesn't pay attention to them. Because in reality, what do we as fans have to look forward to next right. season if they don't do anything? Right? right. Like not nothing. much. Right? You're gonna but sell it, us and Andy Dalton in a set in an eight and nine record. You know, right. and the worst part about it is you wouldn't even be that surprised if they didn't do anything. Right at this point, it would just be another day at the office. Yeah, for the it's Bears. just a Ryan Pace thing, right? Right. But Pace and Matt are their football guys, so they right. got it all except for the winning and the quarterback. Right. But everything else, guys, <laughs> is there. We're, I yeah, hope we do there. a live draft show. That's what I. <laughs> it's gonna. That's happen. what I want to do. I want to do yeah. a live twelve fifty two panel with yeah. us and 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 Mike and and yep. Alan and. Hell, if Fred and Dave and, and Les want to jump on right. too, we just talk about the picks that get that yeah. every pick for the first day. I'm cool with, you know what I mean. Yeah. And then, you know, then us, the the OGs of the 1252, right. can do the next couple of days. But I think well, that would be a fun show the, to do, especially since the second round is happens to fall on a Friday, which happens. Yeah, to be that's a pick. turtle steak show, right there. So, Turtles take dra- yep. round two draft special. Round baby. two draft special featuring our Absolutely. boy, the ace. Speaking of specials, did you guys talk about Sunday? We did. We talked about it, but we could never talk about it too much. That's we right. Talked- this Sunday, yep. Nick and Ivy Brewery, 
Come out, see your boys from the 1252. All of us are going to be there as far as I know, right? Yeah, I think, yeah, I think absolutely. Attendance. Yeah, mask up, get your hand sanitizer. And come drink the, some beer. And come drink some beer. I've never been there. I'm super pumped to go. I've heard Mike talk about it. Fred's talked about how much he loves it there. Yeah. Um, it'll be it'll be a fun time. I love that it's an earlier show too. Yes. So like we can get it done, get the show started, yeah. and then enjoy ourselves afterwards, you know? Yeah. Which absolutely. is always a plus. It won't be super late. So right. that'll be that'll be Definitely. fun. Definitely. It'll yeah. be a great Definitely. time for sure. Well, boys, it was another great show. Angela, we always appreciate you coming on and adding that extra firepower to I to love being show. here. I feel like I'm like the third brother on this show. You are absolutely. You're you're always absolutely. Welcome. That's yeah. welcome anytime. Absolutely. Real hey, quick, man, don't guys. forget right here. Hold on, Wait, where is it? Right, <laughs> right here. There, you're right over. There you go. That's my uh, that's my Twitter handle. S P O copy at M O B R T C O U R T A C Sport yeah. Court A C. Get me to that 200 followers. Two chances to win MLB the show. Absolutely. Uh, with, with, my, with my boy Tatis Jr. on the front. I mean, that. what else can you ask for? A free video game. Right. Absolutely. Yeah, go so. give Angelo a follow, guys. We want to give a big special thanks to Julie for jumping on with us. She was a great interview. We really appreciate it. Uh, thank you to our sponsors, Nick and Ivy Brewing. Come see us out there on Sunday, and thank you to the John Darren team at the Coldwell Banker Real Estate Group, and thank all of you guys for joining us. It was a terrific show. We appreciate it. Have a good night, everyone. Peace out.